Professor Menachem Megidor Nesi, Universidad Ivrit, Professor Martha Nussbaum, Ernst Freund, Distinguished Service Professor of Law and Ethics at the University of Chicago, Kahal Nichbad Mahod, Beruchim Habaim. The Melton Center for Jewish Education established this distinguished lecture series in those academic areas of expertise in which Professor Seymour Fox invested his considerable intellectual acumen while he crafted with great vigor a vision of education in general and Jewish education in particular. Fox was an engaged intellectual, bridging the theoretical and the practical. He was an institution builder, our own Melton Center being one of his many thriving educational endeavors the world over. We will have a chance tonight in the framework of the inaugural lecture to hear from two speakers about Professor Frax. It is my pleasure to invite Professor Mergidor, the CEO of Versa, to open the conference. Uh, this is a memorial lecture in memory of in intellectual, academic leader, institution builder, as Mark Hirschman said before. Um, some of the pillars of the, uh, of the Hebrew University and someone who is, uh, was a very close uh, personal friend, uh, Seymour Fox, which I miss him very, very badly. Seymour was a unique combination of visionary, of somebody who can think about the grand scale, who can uh, be involved, and I'll say a few sentences in a minute about it, about content, not just, not, not just about form and structure, and at the same time, a man of action, somebody that can get the ideas, the vision, implemented. Someone, someone who, while having the big dreams, was cognizant of the uh, intricacies of uh, the academic environment, of the uh, human relationship that needed in, in order to, uh, to implement a grand, a grand vision and a, grand, uh, a great, uh, great idea. Seymour was working for many, many years, establishing the, um, or uh, forming, it, it wasn't the founder of the School of Education here at the Hebrew University. His contribution to, uh, to Jewish education is enormous. And let me emphasize again the importance of the um, emphasis on content. There is a lot of discussion in the educational systems, and we know it, about form, structure, the way the system is managed, the way the, the system is financed. Even consider the, the debates that are going on now in the Israeli uh, public arena whether even go, going back to the Dovrat uh, uh, Commission. To think about the, the thing that goes on right now when we talk about the reform in the system, where uh, uh, around the teacher strikes and all the, um, uh, all the issues. But if you notice, there is very little discussion of content. There is very little uh, uh, thought being given to what, what you expect from the uh, uh, from the, I would hate to use this term, the product of the system, but the, the, uh, the student, the society, what, what exactly are we expecting and what exactly should be the content of the, or the subject matter of the education system. Seymour was a person that was able to combine both a very deep uh, engagement with the, uh, with the content issues, especially of course about Jewish education, what does it mean to be an educated Jew, we had many uh, informal discussions about it, and uh, somebody who uh, knows how to form the, the, uh, the structure, the, uh, the organization, to get things uh, implemented, and that's a very unique combination. On a personal level, um, I said before, Seymour was a very, very close friend, somebody I could trust, somebody that is uh, wise advice, is something I always uh, uh, seeked. I was sold, um, someone that I really miss very, very badly. The thing I can say about Seymour that uh, is a very, uh, fitting, a very fitting epitaph to him would be what uh, the line from, uh, uh, from Bialik's uh, poem, Meshirat Chayav Baim and the uh, poetry of his life was uh, abruptly um, um, interrupted. Seymour was, uh, while retired officially from the Hebrew University, was uh, in, a, um, in the midst of a very, very uh, energetic, very um, um, 
very intensive effort to create some more programs, some more ideas getting, getting him implemented. And his untimely death is something which we all mourn and we all lose, we all miss. Uh, le let me just uh, 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 say just one word about the subject of the, our um, distinguished um, uh, uh, lecture that, uh, uh, that humanistic education. This is something that I think should be very much on, uh, uh, on our agenda, agenda for education system. And I know it's not necessarily easy because uh, uh, if you talk about an educational system which is much bigger, which is much more inclusive, uh, the issue of humanistic, you, you tend to, uh, to define the, uh, the success, the outcome in terms of very functional, uh, measurable criteria. Humanistic education does not always fit uh, this, uh, this paradigm. I think it's very, very important that we grasp again the, uh, uh, or raise again the flag of uh, humanistic education. Now, of course, there is the issue of what, the, what does it mean humanistic education? Probably there is less uh, agreement about the, um, what, uh, w w what is the core. There is the issue of the cultural dependence, uh, whether uh, uh, you should be, uh, um, to what extent you are uh, Judeo-centric or uh, Caucasian-centric or uh, uh, whatever. But um, uh, I believe that in order to have an healthy society, in order to have uh, an engaged uh, members of the society, it is essential that we give a lot of thought to the um, to humanistic aspect of the, our education system, including the uh, university. And uh, one of my, uh, I must admit, my great failures here, that um, um, we're not able to move a little bit, and I will here I confess, a little bit more to the model of uh, liberal arts education. Maybe not, not all, of the, all of the way here. We are still based on the, uh, here at the Hebrew University, on the, um, on the German um, sp specialization model um, of the 19th century. Some uh, people have even blamed us for being the last remaining German university in the world. But, uh, uh, but anyway, I think that the subject of today, and especially its interaction with the global issues, I think it's something that, which is a fascinating subject that we should all address, and I'm looking forward for hearing the, uh, the talk of today. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure now to invite Professor Michael Rosenack, the Mandel Professor of Educa Jewish Education, to say a few words remembering Professor Fox, essentially remembering his gift to education. First of all, I wish to apologize for speaking Hebrew, but as I thought I had been asked, given the fact that this is the Hebrew University, and uh, our students are Hebrew speakers, and uh, they, are, they also stand near the center of the activities of this afternoon. I have a friend of Professor Hirschman, who spoke on a few words. I have to say a few words on a few words, and I will try to do it. ואני אזכיר לכם שבמשך השנה, שנה וחצי, מאז פטירתו של סימו זכרונו לברכה, היו הרבה אירועים של הספד ושל אבל, ויש ביטוי מאוד יפה שמופיע בסוף פרשת וזאת הברכה, ותמו ימי אבל משה. יש זמן להתחיל להכניס את האדם שחושבים עליו, שמוקירים אותו, להכניס אותו לדו-שיח בין הדורות, כפי שנאמר במותו של אברהם לינקון, Now he belongs to the ages, עכשיו הוא שייך לכל הדורות, אז אדם שהוא רציני, כפי שהוא גם הוגדר כרגע כאן, הוא האדם שאפשר להמשיך לשוחח איתו, והשיחה לא תם. אני רוצה לכן, בשתיים, שלוש דקות, להזכיר נושא אחד שהיה מאוד קרוב לליבו של סימו, 
נושא שהעסיק אותו תמיד, ושהוא על סמך החזון שיצא מתוך הרעיון הזה, הוא בנה מוסדות כפי שכבר הוזכר. אני רוצה לדבר על מוסד אחד ועל רעיון אחד שאנחנו יכולים ואנחנו חייבים לפתח אותו ולדבר עליו. כידוע, פרופסור פוקס היה מייסד של תוכנית עמיתי ירושלים ואני הייתי לשמחתי שותף גם בתכנון והיינו מטיילים ביחד אחרי הצהריים בשבת והיינו שואלים את השאלה מה, מה האידיאל, מי הבוגר האידיאל של המוסד הזה? הוא אומר, בשביל, בשבילי זה ברור, הוא אמר. הוא צריך להיות שילוב של אוניברסיטי אוף שיקגו וישיבה. מי שזוכר שהוא אמר את זה, אני רואה אנשים צוחקים. הרעיון של אוניברסיטי אוף שיקגו כאן לא היה כל כך great books. התוכנית של הושינס, אבל יותר הרעיונות של ג'וסף שוואב ואחרים שהגישו את החשיבות של הדליברציה, רעיון שהוא פותח מאוד בכתבי דיוי, אבל נמצא גם בכתבי פירס. הרעיון הוא שיש דרך אחת מועילה לחשוב על דברים שהיא מאפשרת לנו לגלות גם את הבעיה הבסיסית ואולי גם להגיע לפתרונות של בעיות. הדבר הראשון, האין נוחות שיש לבני אדם כאשר, כאשר יש איזושהי בעיה שעומדת ברקע, הוא שכאשר אדם מרגיש, או קבוצה מרגישה, או עם מרגיש, שמשהו לא קשור, קשורה, הוא עושה, הוא עושה חושבים. הוא עושה חושבים עם אנשים שמסוגלים, שהם מומחים, שהם מעוניינים ואחרי גילוי ה-problematic situation כפי שהוא קרא לזה אנחנו מגלה את ה- מגלים את ה-problem, את הבעיה ואז אולי גם את ה-solution, את הפתרון. הרעיון הזה היה מאוד חשוב לו, אבל גם הרעיון של הישיבה והרעיון הישיבה היא, הוא שאפילו הדליברציה צריכה להגן על המסורת האיתנה. וכאשר המסורת לא מתפקדת כראוי, צריכים לדון ולראות איך אפשר לתקן, לחדש, לרענן, כדי שאפשר יהיה לחיות בתוך המסורת הזאת. עכשיו הבעיה המעניינת, זאת אומרת העולם של הישיבה. Uh, הבעיה בעצם הדליברציה לנוכח הישיבה שהדליברציה שצריכה לשרת את הנורמה יכולה, הדליברציה הזאת יכולה בקלות להפך לרועץ לפתח אפיונים אימפריאליסטיים שלמעשה בסופו של דבר הדליברציה עצמה היא המטרה. סימו היה מאוד, מאוד מודע, <coughs> סליחה, מאוד מודע לבעיה הזאת ועד יומו האחרון התמודד איתה ואני חושב שזאת מורשה חשובה שהוא נתן לנו שאנחנו גם אנחנו נמשיך להתמודד בה. תודה פרופסור רוזנק. בימים אלה של מצוקה ישנה משנה חשיבות בדבריה הנחרצים של פרופסור נוסבאום אודות מקומם החיוני, החיוני של לימודים גבוהים בכלל ומדעי הרוח בפרט. A brief introduction to פרופסור נוסבאום, you're much better served by just googling and, and you'll see it just uh, 40 honorary doctorates, you just name it, it's there. So I'm just doing a, a praise C. Professor Nussbaum, it is an honor, an honor and a pleasure to host you here on Mount Scopus. 
your own intellectual rigor, academic energy, and broad range of interests make you the ideal inaugural lecturer in this series. And I think that it is fortuitous that both you, Shati Badli Rechayim Tovim Varukim, and Professor Fak Zichorongi Vracha found the University of Chicago to be their intellectual birth. Professor Nussbaum's award-winning published works cover such disparate fields as the role of emotion in the law, the democracies in Southern Asia, Southern Asia, sex and social justice, and in our context, extremely important works on education, both in antiquity, her therapy of desire has been a very important work to me, and higher education in her own day. Of the many, many prizes she's won, it's appropriate to mention in our context the 2002 Graumeyer Award in education for her award-winning Cultivating Humanity, a classical defense of reform in liberal education. It is with great pleasure and honor that I ask Professor Nussbaum to deliver the inaugural Seymour Fox Lecture on the subject of humanistic education and global justice. Thank you very much. It's actually very moving to me and a great honor to be asked to give this first Seymour Fox Memorial Lecture. I unfortunately never had a chance to know Professor Fox, but I have read some of his work and, and the vision that, that he had is uh, very moving to me. So thank you so much for inviting me and thanks also to the members of the Fox family who are here. I want to start with a quotation from the great Indian philosopher and educator Rabindranath Tagore who wrote during the First World War about a change in uh, not only people's ways of looking at life generally, but it, it, it was also a change in education. <laughs> History has come to a stage when the moral man, the complete man, is more and more giving way, almost without knowing it, to make room for the commercial man, the man of limited purpose. This process, aided by the wonderful progress in science, is assuming gigantic proportion and power causing the upset of man's moral balance, obscuring his human side under the shadow of soulless organization. And now I'm going to just begin with two real life examples which illustrate in different ways a profound crisis in education that faces us today, although I think we haven't yet faced it. All illustrate the crisis in both education and citizenship to which Tagore was referring, a crisis that was already deep in his own lifetime and that has become still more profound in ours. First, in the fall of 2006, the United States Department of Education's Commission on the Future of Higher Education, headed, to, headed by Secretary of Education Margaret Spellings, released a report on the state of higher education in the nation. This report, focused entirely on education for national economic enrichment, profitability in the global market. It concerned itself with perceived deficiencies in science, technology, and engineering, not even basic scientific research in these areas, but only highly applied learning, learning that can quickly generate profit-making strategies. The humanities, the arts, and critical thinking, so important, as I'll argue, for a decent global citizenship, were basically absent. And the suggestion of the report was that it would be perfectly all right if these abilities were allowed to wither away in favor of more useful things. Second example, in March 2006, so now I'm switching to, to India, but with an American aspect, uh, Harvard's President Lawrence Summers, uh, now ex-president, traveled to India to host a three-day event that was known as Harvard in India. Summers is well known in America for his energetic denigration of the humanities, whose role in the core curriculum in Harvard he sought to reduce, and especially for his opposition to the study of critical ethical reasoning, which he sought to remove entirely from the undergraduate core curriculum. His aim was consistently to build up the portion of the curriculum devoted to useful exercises in science and technology, 
Well, Harvard in India was no different. The message delivered by Summers to the enthusiastic members of the Indian business community, already gung-ho about the same goal, uh, was that Harvard could help India develop its technology sec sector by helping them build the educational system, transform it more in that direction, thus making India able to capture a larger share of the global market. Once again, the educational emphasis was not even on creative basic science, it was on science for short-term profit in industry. Well, not to belabor the obvious, there are hundreds of stories like these two, and new ones arrive every day in the US, in Europe, in India, and no doubt in other parts of the world as well. Given that economic growth is so eagerly sought by all nations, too few questions are being posed in all the nations of the world about the direction of education and with it of democratic society. With the rush to profitability in the global market, values precious for the future of democracy and for the creation of a decent global society are in danger of getting lost. Now the profit motive suggests to most concerned politicians that science and technology are of crucial importance for the future health of their nations. I certainly have no objection to good scientific and technical education, and I don't suggest that nations should stop trying to improve in this regard. My concern is that other abilities, equally crucial, are at risk of getting lost in the competitive flurry. Abilities crucial to the creation of a minimally just world culture and a robust type of global citizenship capable of constructively addressing the world's most pressing problems. And these abilities, as I'll argue, are associated with the humanities and the arts. I'll make my argument by pursuing the contrast that my examples have already suggested by, between an education for profit making and an education for a more inclusive type of citizenship. But let me introduce that contrast via a contrast familiar in discussions of global justice and global citizenship between two conceptions of a nation's development. The old, narrowly economic conception of development and a richer, more inclusive notion of what is now called human development. Throughout, I'm going to allude to examples from India because that's where most of my own development work has been conducted and it does include quite a lot of work on education. Well, so we hear these days a good deal of talk about human development and the human development approach or otherwise known as the human capabilities approach. Uh, I've spent a lot of my own time as a philosopher uh, in that movement and of course uh, it has led to a certain broadening of development's focus so as to encompass broader human ends. So let's ask then what an education for human development might look like and how it would differ for, from an education for the old model of development as economic enrichment. The old model of development, the one that has uh, so often been criticized by development practitioners who are concerned with ethical issues of inclusion and equality, says that the goal of development is a nation's economic growth. Never mind about distribution and social equality, never mind about the preconditions of stable democratic government, never mind about the improvement of other aspects of a human being's quality of life that are not well correlated with economic growth. This model of development has by now been richly criticized, but it continues to dominate a great deal of policy making, especially policies influenced by the US, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund. In the context of this paradigm of what it is for a nation to develop, what is on everyone's lips is the need for an education that promotes national development seen as economic growth, and that, of course, is what my examples were getting at. What sort of education does that old model of development suggest? Well, education for economic enrichment certainly needs basic skills, literacy, and numeracy. It also needs some people to have more advanced skills in computer science, engineering, and technology, although equal access is not terribly important. A nation can grow very nicely while the rural poor remain illiterate and without basic computer resources, as recent events in many states within India show. In states such as Gujarat and Andhra Pradesh, we've seen the creation of increased GNP per capita through the education of a technical elite who make the state attractive to foreign investors. The results of that enrichment do not trickle down to the rural poor. They do not improve their health or well-being, and there's no reason to think 
that enrichment requires, educating them adequately. That was always the first and most basic problem with the GNP per capita paradigm of development. It neglects distribution and can give very high marks to nations or states that contain alarming inequalities. After that, education for enrichment needs perhaps a rudimentary familiarity with history and economic fact on the part of those people who are going to get past elementary education in the first place, which may be a relatively small elite. But care must be taken lest the historical and economic narrative lead to any serious critical thinking about class, about whether foreign investment is really good for the rural poor, about whether democracy can survive when such huge inequalities and in basic life chances obtain. So critical thinking would probably not be a very important part of education for economic enrichment, and it has not been in states that have pursued this goal relentlessly, such as the Western Indian state of Gujarat, which is well known for its combination of technological sophistication with extreme docility and groupthink. The student's freedom of mind is dangerous if what's wanted is a group of technically trained, docile technicians to carry out the plans of elites who are aiming at foreign investment and technological development. Critical thinking will then probably be discouraged, as it long has been discouraged in the public schools of Gujarat. History, I said, might be essential, but enrichment educators will not want a history that focuses on injustices of class, caste, gender, and ethno-religious membership because that will prompt critical thinking about the present. Nor will such educators want any serious consideration of the rise of nationalism, of the damages done by nationalist ideals, and of the ways in which the moral imagination too often becomes numbed under the sway of technical mastery. So the version of history that will be presented will present national ambition as a great good and will very likely downplay issues of poverty and inequality. Once again, real life examples of this sort of education are all too easy to find. In fact, one of the most graphic examples of this disquieting feature of an India shining type of education, if I might uh, call it that, using the recent campaign slogan of the Hindu right party, the BJP, which combined a focus on economic growth and foreign investment with support for religious polarization and even violence, is the portrayal of the human development approach itself in the textbooks published during the ascendancy of that party for national consumption, with textbooks to be memorized, regurgitated by all students on national exams. Although these details about Indian public schools might seem a bit remote, I, I'm sure you know from your own experience how textbooks are actually quite crucial in shaping a young person's view of the world. And by looking closely at what is actually in there, you can often have your finger on the pulse of where a nation is going. Well, I was initially delighted to discover that the 10th grade social science book, Contemporary India, had a chapter on the human development approach as an alternative to approaches to development that focus on economic growth alone. Since an Indian citizen, Amartya Sen, was the chief architect of this approach, it's not surprising that it was in an Indian school book, and India has been energetic in implementing the approach. But it was highly disconcerting to find three large errors in this brief account. First, the book claimed that according to the human development approach, human development and not economic development is the ultimate goal, but, quote, the importance of economic growth among all contributory factors of development is paramount, end quote. Now, Sen, in fact, actually argues through careful empirical studies that economic growth contributes little or nothing to the improvement of education and health, two of the main goals of the human development approach. He recommends that each separate part of human development be given a separate analysis to see what factors, in fact, do promote it. The Hindu right party, the BJP's support for leaders such as Andhra Pradesh's Chandra Babu Naidu, who promoted foreign investment while doing nothing about the health and education of the rural poor, speaks through this sentence, which I think is a nearly slanderous deformation of what Sen has actually argued. Second, it's asserted that the approach analyzes development, quote, in context of an average individual, end quote, whereas, in fact, the approach, as practiced everywhere, insists on disaggregating the population into discrete segments, 
not resting content with the GNP approach's emphasis on the situation of an average individual, but instead focusing particular attention on people and groups that might be thought to enjoy a particularly low quality of life, such as women, the rural poor, and various ethnic and religious minorities. So once again, the ideology of India shining shows its colors, promote a glorious average, and we don't need to think about how those at the bottom are doing. Third and worst, the whole discussion is introduced by the following sentence. In social development, whatever benefit an individual derives is only as a collective being. Now this is actually an idea that both Sen and I have rejected. Uh, we insist that each and every individual person must be seen as an end, not as a means, and that it's ethically wrong to present development in terms of the well-being simply of collectivities. We stress that even a community such as the family, in which intense love and loyalty putatively obtain, may be the site of great inequalities of opportunity. So it's crucial to ask not just even how this household is doing, but how each and every person in it is doing. This error, too, seems more ideology than mistake, since it expresses the communitarian ethos of the Hindu right, which is quite uh, hostile to the idea of human rights. These errors already look quite ideological and attempt to make the influential human development approach look like it supports BJP economic policies. But um, the rest of the presentation of history in the book becomes even more flagrantly political, distorting history to prevent the student's thought from focusing on poverty and inequality. The book called Ancient India toes the orthodox Hindu right line, saying that early Hindu India was a wonderful place with no big problems. The introductory chapter ends with a long citation from a British historian named Basham, who wrote a book called The Wonder That Was India. And this says, quote, in no other part of the ancient world were the relations of man and man and of man and the state so fair and humane. No other ancient lawgiver proclaimed such noble ideas of fair play as did Manu. In all her history of warfare, Hindu India has few tales to tell of cities put to the sword or massacres of non-combatants. To us, the most striking feature of ancient Indian civilization is its humanity. Now, this romanticizing account of early India omits, as many Indian historians quickly noted, the issues of caste and class oppression, the misery of the poor, and very conspicuously, the situation of women, because Manu was one of the famous uh, oppressors of women in history. And uh, of course, it also suggests that because there was no problem of um, violence, those problems must have been introduced later when the Muslims arrived. So it's hardly surprising that other books in the series contain further distortions portraying religious minorities, particularly Muslims, as dangerous and is inevitably linked to violence and terrorism. We now notice something quite interesting. Education for natural, national enrichment converges conveniently with the sort of ideological education favored by the Hindu right, who are hardly unique in the world in linking right-wing ideology to a gung-ho development of science and technology. It sometimes looks as if there's a tension between two aims of that party, the aim to promote economic growth through foreign investment and the aim to promote ethnic purity. Certainly, it seems as though one might separate those two things, as indeed in the US. It might have seemed that one could separate the Republican Party's economic ideology from its darker politics of ideological extremism and fear. However, education for enrichment needs docile students, students who don't think critically, and particularly students who have learned to ignore systematically the inequalities that are fostered by a policy based on economic growth alone. And the idea that we must ignore such inequalities in history dovetails very nicely with the Hindu rights aim to produce an account of the past in which all Hindus were happy and peaceful in the Indus Valley until the Muslims arrived, and to suppress the work of historians who emphasize issues of caste and gender or the complex cooperation and syncretism between Hindus and Muslims throughout Indian history. I've been speaking about critical thinking and the role of history. What about the arts and literature, so often valued by democratic educators? An education for national enrichment will, first of all, basically have contempt for those parts of a child's training because they don't lead to enrichment. Indian parents today take pride in a child who gains admission to the institutes of technology and management. 
They're ashamed of a child who studies literature or philosophy or who wants to paint or dance or sing. But educators for enrichment will do more than ignore the arts. They will fear them. For a cultivated and developed sympathy is a particularly dangerous enemy of ethical obtuseness. And ethical obtuseness is key to carrying out programs of enrichment that ignore inequality. As Rabindranath Tagore said, aggressive nationalism needs to blunt the moral conscience. So it needs people who don't recognize the individual, who speak group speak, who behave and see the world like docile bureaucrats. Art is a great enemy of that obtuseness, and artists are never the reliable servants of any ideology, even a basically good one. They always are asking the imagination to move beyond its usual confines and see the world in new ways. So educators for enrichment will probably campaign against the humanities and arts as ingredients of basic education. This assault is currently taking place all over the world. Now let's turn to education for human development. Human development is a very broad idea, but the essence of the human development paradigm is that all a minimum of justice requires that all citizens in each nation and ultimately in the world be empowered to have certain abilities, uh, which technically are called capabilities, to uh, function in certain very central ways, which include particularly areas uh, having to do with health, education, political participation, and so on. Now, education for that sort of human development is a very broad idea, including many types of cultivation that are pertinent to a student's personal self-development. It's not simply about citizenship, even when citizenship is broadly understood. It aims, as I say, at cultivating in the student a wide range of abilities and doing so for all. However, I'm going to focus here on the goal of producing decent world citizens who can understand the global problems to which this and other theories of global justice respond and who have the competence and the motivational incentives to do something about those problems. How then might we produce such world citizens? An education for human development as responsible global citizenship has a twofold purpose. It must first promote the human development of its students as global citizens and it must, second, promote the student's understanding of the goals of human development for everyone, as goals inherent in the very idea of a minimally just and decent society, in such a way that when the student is empowered to make political choices, he or she will foster these capabilities, not just for him or herself, but for all citizens. So, to focus on my own version of the approach, such an education will begin from the idea of equal respect for all human beings and the equal entitlement of all to a range of central human capabilities, not just in one's own nation, but everywhere in the world. It thus has, from the start, a profound egalitarian and critical component. So, education will promote the enrichment of the student's own senses, imagination, practical reason, and the other capabilities, and it will also promote a vision of humanity according to which all human beings are entitled to that development on a basis of equality. What sort of education would we want to produce such a goal? Before we can design that scheme for education, we need to understand the problems we face on the way to making students responsible citizens who might possibly implement a human development agenda. What is it about human life that makes it so hard to sustain egalitarian democratic institutions and so easy to lapse into hierarchies of various types, or even worse, projects of violent group animosity. Whatever those forces are, it's ultimately against them that true education for human development must fight. So it must, as I would put it following Gandhi, engage with the clash of civilizations within each person as respect for others contends against narcissistic aggression. This internal clash can be found in all modern societies in different forms, since all contain struggles over inclusion and equality, whether the precise locus of these struggles is in debates about immigration, or the accommodation of religious, racial, and ethnic minorities, or sex equality, or affirmative action. In all societies, too, there are forces in the human personality that militate against mutual recognition and reciprocity. 
as well as forces of compassion and respect that give egalitarian democracy support. Particular social and political structures, however, make a big difference to the outcome of these struggles. Any account of human bad behavior has two aspects, the structural institutional and the individual psychological. By now, there's a large body of psychological research showing that average human beings will engage in bad behavior in certain types of situation. Stanley Milgram famously showed that experimental subjects have a high level of deference to authority. Most people in his often repeated experiments were willing to administer a painful and they believed very dangerous shock to an, another person so long as the superintending scientist told them that what they were doing was all right even when the subject, who of course wasn't really being shocked, was screaming in pain. Solomon Ash earlier showed that experimental subjects are willing to go against the clear evidence of their senses when all the other people around them are making sensory judgments that are off target. His very rigorous and oft confirmed research shows the unusual subservience of normal human beings to peer pressure. Both Milgram's work and Ash's were famously used by Christopher Browning to illuminate the behavior of young Germans in a police battalion during the Holocaust. Still other research demonstrates that apparently normal people are willing to engage in behavior that humiliates and stigmatizes if their situation is set up in a certain way, casting them in a dominant role and telling them that the others are their inferiors. One particularly chilling example involves school children whose teacher informs them that children with blue eyes are superior and children with brown eyes are inferior. Hierarchical and stigmatizing behavior quickly ensues. The teacher then informs the children that she's made a mistake. It's actually the children with brown eyes who are superior and the children with blue eyes who are inferior. Well, the stigmatizing behavior simply reverses itself. The children who were stigmatized seem to have learned quite nothing from the pain of discrimination. Perhaps the most famous experiment of this type is Philip Zimbardo's Stanford prison experiment in which he found that subjects randomly cast in the role of prisoner and prison guard began to behave differently almost right away. The prisoners became passive and depressed. The guards used their power to humiliate and stigmatize. I believe that this experiment was badly designed in a number of ways and is thus less than conclusive, particularly because Zimbardo gave elaborate instructions to the guards telling them that their goal should be to induce feelings of alienation and despair in the prisoners. Nonetheless, his findings are at least highly suggestive and when combined with a large amount of other research, corroborates the idea that people who are not individually pathological can behave very badly to others in certain situations. So we have to look at two things, the individual and the situation. Situations are not the only thing that matters, for research does find individual differences, and it's also plausibly interpreted as showing the influence of widely shared human psychological tendencies. So we need ultimately to do what Gandhi did and look deeply into the psychology of the person, asking what we can do to help compassion and empathy win the clash over fear and hate. But situations matter too, and imperfect people will no doubt act much worse when placed in structures of certain types. And what are those types? Well, again, research suggests several things. First, people behave much worse when they are not held personally accountable. Under the shelter of anonymity, as parts of a faceless mass, people do things that they wouldn't do when they're watched and made accountable as individuals. Second, people behave much worse when nobody raises a critical voice. Ash's subjects went along with the erroneous judgment when all the other people in the experiment, whom they took to be fellow experimental subjects, concurred in the error. But if even one other person said something different, they were then freed to follow their own perception and judgment. Third, people behave worse when the human beings over whom they have power are dehumanized and de-individualized. In a wide range of situations, people behave much worse when the other is portrayed as a thing or an animal or given a number rather than a name and so on. Situations are important, but we also have to look beneath them to gain some understanding of the forces in the human personality that make decent citizenship such a rare attainment. Gandhi, I think, understood this problem at a very deep level. About the specific nature of the struggle to be waged, however, Gandhi did not give us very good guidance since he suggested that our difficulties 
in political life derive, in essence, from the bodily appetites and require for their overcoming the successful repression or even extinction of those appetites. My own view of the internal clash, uh, which I developed in, in two books about the emotions, is, is rather different, and I've developed it recently further in writing about religious violence in India. Understanding what the internal clash is uh, centrally about, uh, I argue, requires thinking about human beings' problematic relationship to our mortality and finitude, our persistent desire to transcend conditions that are painful for any intelligent being to accept. The earliest experiences of a human infant contain a jolting alternation between blissful completeness in which the whole world seems to revolve around the child's needs and an agonizing awareness of helplessness when good things do not arrive when the child wants them and the child can do nothing to ensure their arrival. Human beings have a level of physical helplessness completely unknown elsewhere in the animal kingdom, combined with a also unparalleled level of cognitive sophistication. So infants are very keenly aware of what is happening to them, but they can't do anything about it. The expectation of being attended to constantly, the infantile omnipotence so well captured in Freud's phrase, his majesty, the baby, is joined to the anxiety and ultimately the shame of knowing that one is not in fact omnipotent but utterly helpless. Out of this anxiety and shame emerge an urgent desire for completeness and fullness that never completely departs, however much the child learns that it's but one part of a world of finite, needy beings. And the desire to transcend the shame of incompleteness leads to much instability and moral danger. In writing about the role of shame and disgust in the process of group formation and social intolerance, I've argued that the type of bad behavior that I'm talking about here can be traced to a child's early pain at the fact that it's unable to achieve the blissful completeness that in certain moments it's encouraged to expect. This pain leads to shame and even revulsion at the signs of one's own imperfection. And then what most concerns me here, shame and revulsion in turn are all too monotonously projected outwards onto subordinate groups who can conveniently symbolize the problematic aspects of bodily humanity and human weakness from which people would like to distance themselves. The other side of the internal clash, and this part I think Gandhi got brilliantly right, is the child's growing capacity for compassionate concern, for seeing another person as an end and a full human being, not as a mere tool of its own needs. One of the easiest ways to regain lost omnipotence is to make slaves of others, and young children initially do conceive of the other humans in their lives as mere means to their own satisfaction. But as time goes on, if all goes well, they come to feel gratitude and love toward these separate beings who support their needs, and they thus come to feel guilt about their own aggression and real concern for the well-being of another person. As concern develops, it leads to an increasing wish to control one's own aggression. The child recognizes that its parents are not its slaves, but separate beings with rights to the, a life of their own. Such recognitions are typically unstable, since human life is a, an uneven business and we all feel anxieties that lead us to want more control over others. But a good development in the family and a good education later on can make a child feel genuine compassion for the needs of others and can lead it to see them as people with rights equal to its own. The outcome of the internal clash is greatly affected not just by family development and early education, but also by external political events, which may make the personalities of citizens more or less secure. In writing recently about religious tensions in the United States, I've documented the way in which specific periods of political and economic insecurity led to increasing antipathy and even at times violence toward religious minorities who seemed to threaten cherished traditions. Such insecurities make it particularly easy to demonize strangers or foreigners, and of course that tendency is greatly augmented when the group of strangers is plausibly seen as a threat to the security of the nation. Educators can't alter such real events. They can, however, go to work on the pathological or heightened response to them, hoping to produce a more balanced and critical response. So now that we have a sense of the terrain on which education for human development must work, 
We can say some things, quite tentative and incomplete, but still radical in the present world culture concerning the abilities that such an education will cultivate. Three values, I would argue, are particularly important to decent global citizenship. The first is the capacity for Socratic self-criticism and critical thought about one's own traditions. As Socrates argues, democracy needs citizens who can think for themselves rather than simply deferring to authority, which as I've said, people are all too ready to do, who can reason together about their choices rather than simply trading claims and counter claims. <coughs> Critical thinking is particularly crucial for good citizenship in any society that needs to come to grips with the presence of people who differ by ethnicity, caste, or religion will only have a chance at an adequate dialogue across cultural boundaries if young citizens know how to engage in dialogue and deliberation in the first place. And they will only know how to do that if they learn how to examine themselves and to think about the reasons why they are inclined to support one thing rather than another, rather than, as so often happens, seeing political debate as simply a way of boasting or getting an advantage for their own side. When politicians bring simplistic propaganda their way, as politicians in every country monotonously do, young people will only have a hope of preserving independence and holding the politicians accountable if they know how to think critically about what they hear, testing its logic and its concepts and imagining alternatives to it. Students exposed to instruction in critical thinking learn at the same time a new attitude to those who disagree with them. Consider the case of Billy Tucker, a 19-year-old student in a business college whom I interviewed. Uh, he was required to take a series of liberal arts courses, including one in philosophy. In the philosophy class, Tucker began by learning about the life and death of Socrates, and he, was, he said he was strangely moved by that man who would actually give up life itself for the pursuit of the argument. Then the students learned a little formal logic, and Tucker was very surprised to find that he could do that. He had never before thought he could do well in something abstract. Next, they analyzed political speeches and editorials, looking for logical flaws. And finally, in the last phase of the course, they were assigned to do research for classroom debates on issues of the day. And Tucker was very surprised to find that he was assigned to argue against the death penalty, which he actually strongly favors. And he told me this was the first time he got the picture that you could actually produce arguments on behalf of a position that you don't hold yourself. And he said this totally transformed his attitude to political debate. Now he's much more likely to be curious about the reasons on the other side, to ask whether the two sides might actually share certain common premises, to try to pinpoint where they actually do differ. And so uh, we can see that this also, in the process, humanizes the political other, making the mind see that opposing form not just as a, a blank object, but as a rational being who may share at least some thoughts with one's own self. The idea that one will take responsibility for one's own reasoning and exchange ideas with others in an atmosphere of mutual respect for reason is essential to the peaceful resolution of differences, both within a nation and in a world increasingly polarized by ethnic and religious con uh, conflict. Critical thinking as a discipline can be taught as a part of a school's curriculum, but it will not be well taught if it's taught as something handed down top-down by authority, it needs to inform also the entire spirit of a school's pedagogy. Each child needs to be treated as a rational being whose powers of mind are unfolding and who's expected to make an active and creative contribution to classroom discussion. Rabindranath Tagore's famous school in India, for example, was conceived and described as a self-governing community in which children were encouraged to seek intellectual self-reliance and freedom. In one syllabus, Tagore wrote, quote, the mind will receive its impressions by full freedom given for inquiry and experience and at the same time will be stimulated to think for itself. Our mind does not gain true freedom by acquiring materials for knowledge and possessing other people's ideas, but by forming its own standards of judgment and producing its own thoughts. Accounts of his practice as a teacher report that he repeatedly Im imitated Socrates, putting problems before the students, but then eliciting answers from them by questioning. 
Let's now consider the relevance of this ability to the current state of modern democracies surrounded by a powerful global marketplace. First of all, we can report that even if we were just aiming at economic success, leading corporate executives understand very well the importance of creating corporate cultures in which critical voices are not silenced, cultures of both individuality and accountability. Leading business educators in the US often say that they trace some of our biggest disasters, the failures of certain parts of the NASA space program, the even more disastrous failure of Enron and WorldCom, to a culture of yes people, deferential to authority and to peer pressure, in which critical ideas were encour never encouraged to come forward. But our goal, as I've said, is not simply enrichment, so let's now turn to political culture. As I've said, human beings are prone to be subservient to both authority and peer pressure. To prevent this from turning into atrocity, we need to counteract these tendencies, producing, as far as we can, a culture of individual dissent. Ash found that one critical voice can have large consequences. By emphasizing each person's active voice, we also promote a culture of individual accountability. When people see their ideas as their own responsibility, they're much more likely also to see their deeds as their own responsibility. That was essentially the point that Tagore was making in nationalism when he insisted that the bureaucratization of social life and the relentless machine-like character of the modern state had deadened people's moral imaginations, leading them to acquiesce in atrocities with no twinge of conscience. The second ability of the modern democratic citizen, I would argue, is the ability to see oneself as a member of a heterogeneous nation and an even more heterogeneous world, understanding something of the history and character of the diverse groups that inhabit it. Knowledge is no guarantee of good behavior, but ignorance is a virtual guarantee of bad behavior. Simple cultural and religious stereotypes abound in our world. For example, the facile equation of Islam with terrorism. And the first way to begin combating these is to make sure that from the very early age, students learn a different relation to the world. They should gradually come to understand both the differences that make understanding difficult between groups and nations and the shared human needs and interests that make understanding essential if common problems are to be solved. This understanding will promote human development only if it is itself infused by searching critical thinking, thinking that focuses inter alia on differences of power and opportunity. History should be taught with an eye to thinking critically about these differences. At the same time, the traditions and religions of major groups in one's own culture and in the world will be taught with a view to promoting respect for one's fellow world citizens as equals and equally entitled to religious freedom and also to social and economic opportunity. In curricular terms, these ideas suggest that young citizens should learn rudiments of world history and should get a rich and non-stereotypical understanding of the major world religions. And then they should learn, I think, to inquire in much greater depth into at least one unfamiliar tradition, in this way acquiring tools that they could later use elsewhere. At the same time, they all ought to learn about the major traditions, majority and minority within their own nation, focusing on an understanding of how differences of religion, race, and gender have been associated with differential life opportunities. All, finally, should learn at least one foreign language well, seeing that another group of intelligent human beings cuts up the world differently, that all translation is a stammering interpretation, gives a young person an essential lesson in cultural humility. An especially delicate task in this area is the one I've mentioned, that is understanding differences internal to one's own nation. An adequate education for living in a pluralistic democracy must be a multicultural education, by which I mean one that acquaints students in some depth with the histories and cultures of the many different groups with whom they share laws and institutions. This should include religious, ethnic, social, and gender-based groups. Language learning, history, economics, and political science all play a role in promoting this sort of understanding in different ways at different levels. The third ability of the citizen, which is closely related to the first two and necessary to complement it, them, is what I would call the narrative imagination. This means the ability to think what it might be like 
to be in the shoes of a person different from oneself, to be an intelligent reader of that person's story, and to understand the emotions and wishes and desires that someone so placed might have. The cultivation of sympathy has been a key part of many conceptions of education in both Western and non-Western nations. Uh, as I've observed, the moral imagination, always under siege from fear and narcissism, is apt to become obtuse, if not energetically challenged, refined, and cultivated through the development of sympathy and concern. Learning to see another human being, not as a number or a thing, but as a full person, is not an automatic achievement. It must be developed through an education that refines the ability to think about what the experience of another life might be like, and also to understand why one can never fully grasp that other inner world, why any person is always, to a certain extent, dark and mysterious to any other. Instruction in literature and the other arts can cultivate sympathy in many ways through engagement with many different works of literature, music, fine art, and even dance. Dance was a particular focus of Tagore's school, in fact. But thought needs to be given to what the student's particular blind spots are likely to be, and texts should be chosen in consequence. All societies at all times have their particular blind spots, groups within their culture and also groups abroad that are especially likely to be dealt with ignorantly and obtusely. Works of art can be chosen to promote criticism of that obtuseness and a more adequate vision of the unseen. American novelist Ralph Ellison, in a later essay about his great novel, Invisible Man, wrote that a novel like his could be, quote, a raft of perception, hope, and entertainment on which American culture could negotiate the snags and whirlpools that stand between us and the democratic ideal. His novel, of course, takes the inner eyes of its white reader as its theme and its target. His African-American hero is invisible to white society, he tells us, but he says this invisibility is an imaginative and educational failing on the part of the majority, not a biological accident on his. Through the imagination, we may be able to have a kind of insight into the experience of another group or person that's very difficult to attain in daily life, particularly when our world has constructed sharp separations between groups and suspicions that make any encounter very difficult. So we need to cultivate our students' inner eyes, and this means carefully crafted instruction in the arts and humanities, which will bring students into contact with issues of gender, race, ethnicity, and cross-cultural experience and understanding. This artistic instruction can and should be linked to the citizen of the world instruction, since works of art are frequently a key way to begin to understand the achievements and sufferings of a culture different from one's own. There's a further point to be made about what the arts do for the spectator or reader. As Tagore knew, and as radical artists have often emphasized, the arts, by generating pleasure in connection with acts of subver subversion and cultural criticism, produce an endurable and even attractive dialogue with the prejudices of the past, rather than one fraught with fear and defensiveness. I mean, this is why Tagore had his women, who were going to go out and do radical things in society, begin by presenting their ideas through the dance, which was actually a lot more pleasant to accept than, uh, than it would be to accept what the woman was going to actually do in political life. So I think that's also what Ellison meant by calling Invisible Man a raft of perception, hope, and entertainment. That is, that the entertainment is crucial to the ability of the work to deliver perception and hope. It's not just uh, the experience of these performers than uh, like the girls dancing in Tagore's dances that's important. It's the way in which performance offers a venue for reading too, for exploring difficult issues without crippling anxiety. In short, children need to learn that sympathetic receptivity to the other is not unmanly and that manliness does not mean not sharing the grief of the hungry or the daily life of the person whom one fears. This learning can't be promoted by a confrontational approach that says, drop your old images of manliness. It can only be promoted by a culture that is receptive in both curricular content and pedagogical style, in which it's not too bold to say the capacities for love and concern infuse the entirety of the educational endeavor. How are my three abilities of 
citizenship doing in our world today? Very poorly, I fear. Education of the sort I recommend is doing reasonably well in the place where I first studied it, namely the liberal arts portion of US colleges and universities. Indeed, it's this part of the curriculum in institutions like the University of Chicago that particularly attracts philanthropic support. As rich corporate executives remember with pleasure the time when they read philosophy and literature with pleasure and pursued ideas open-endedly. Outside the US, many nations whose university curricula do not include a liberal arts component are now striving to build one. And I was so pleased to hear the words about the, that this might happen here. Uh, many nations are beginning to acknowledge the importance of this in crafting a public response to problems of pluralism, fear, and suspicion that their societies face. Whether reform in this direction will actually take place is hard to say for liberal education has high financial and pedagogical costs. Teaching of the sort I recommend needs small classes or at least small sections where students get copious oral participation and then copious feedback on frequent writing assignments. European professors are not used to that idea and at present they would be horrible at it if they tried to do it since they're not trained as teachers in the way that US graduate students are and they come to expect that holding a chair means not having to teach undergraduates. Even when faculty are keen on the liberal arts model, I'm afraid that bureaucrats are often unwilling to believe that it's necessary to support the number of faculty positions that is required to make it really work. Another problem that European and uh, some Asian universities have is that new disciplines of particular importance to good democratic citizenship have no secure place in the structure of undergraduate education. Women's studies, the study of race and ethnicity, Judaic studies, Islamic studies, all of these are likely to be marginalized, catering only to the student who already knows a lot about the area and who wants to focus on it. In the liberal arts system, by contrast, such new disciplines can provide courses that all undergraduates will take and can also enrich the required liberal arts offerings in other disciplines, such as literature and history. Where there are no such liberal arts requirements, such new disciplines will remain marginal. So the universities of the world have great merits, but also great problems. By contrast, the abilities of citizenship are doing very poorly in every nation in the most crucial years of children's lives, the years that we call in America K through 12, kindergarten through 12th grade. Here, the demands of the global market have made everyone focus on scientific and technical proficiency as the key abilities, and the humanities and the arts are increasingly perceived as useless frills that we can prune away to make sure that our nation, whether it be India or the US, remains competitive. To the extent that there are the focus of national discussion, they are recast as technical abilities themselves to be tested by multiple choice examinations. And the imaginative and critical abilities that lie at their core are typically left aside. In the US, national testing under our No Child Left Behind Act has already made things worse, as national testing usually does. For at least my first and third abilities are not testable at all by quantitative multiple choice exams, and the second is very poorly tested in such ways. In virtually every nation of the world, and often with the parents interested in the enrichment of their child egging this development on, the curriculum is being stripped of its humanistic elements, and the pedagogy of rote learning rules the roost. What will we have if these trends continue? Nations of technically trained people who don't know how to criticize authority, useful profit makers with obtuse imaginations, very little accountability, a great deal of machine-like dehumanization. Tagore called that a suicide of the soul. What could be more frightening than that? Indeed, if you study, as I did for some years, the Indian state of Gujarat, which has for a particularly long time gone down this road with no critical thinking in the public schools and a concerted focus on technical ability, you can see clearly how a band of docile engineers can be welded into a murderous force to enact the most horrendously racist and anti-democratic policies. And yet, how can we avoid going down this road? Democracies have great rational and imaginative powers. They're also prone to very serious flaws in reasoning, to parochialism, peer pressure, authority, and great selfishness. 
education based mainly on profitability in the global market magnifies these deficiencies, producing a greedy obtuseness and a technically trained obedience that threaten the very life of democracy itself, and that certainly impede the creation of a decent world culture. If the real clash of civilizations is, as I believe, a clash within the individual person, as greed and narcissism contend against respect and love, all modern societies are rapidly losing the battle as they feed the forces that lead to violence and dehumanization and fail to feed the forces that lead to cultures of equality, respect, and personal accountability. If we don't insist on the crucial importance of the humanities and the arts, they will drop away because they don't make money. They only do what is much more precious than that, make a world that is worth living in, people who are able to see other human beings as human and nations that are able to overcome fear and suspicion in favor of sympathetic and reasoned debate. Thanks. We do, of course, have time for questions. And uh, Professor Nussbaum has graciously Willing to accept them. The floor is open. This one back there? Yeah, you can uh, help yourself. So I asked this, uh, is there any sociological evidence that Scotch education would be peer pressure or any of the sort of examples you've said before? Surely peer pressure is something inherent, inherent in humans. And therefore, would that reverse something? Well, yeah, as I said, I mean, Zimbardo and others who work in this line do think that what you can do to offset the, these baneful tendencies, which certainly will always be there, is to create a culture of personal accountability and individualization and also a critical culture. I mean, all of these things he has... Um, argued for in his recent book, but I mean, there's, there, there's other research behind that. His book is mainly a summary of a lot of research. And as I said, Ash started the thing by saying that when you have one whistleblower in that group, that already transforms the group. People are freed up from their susceptibility to peer pressure by a critical voice. So, so that's the kind of thing that I'm relying on. Of course, it's very difficult to do studies of curricula and their impact on the political process simply because uh, the curriculum that a child encounters is only one small part of its life experience. And so in America, there are so many forces in the rest of the public culture militating against compassion and respect that you couldn't um, conclude from the failure of such education uh, that, that, that the whole uh, idea is a failure. So I, so I, I think we can't yet I don't know of any studies that would directly confront the issue of curriculum. But another kind of research that's, I think, very pertinent here is Dan Batson's work on compassion. And he has, for years, been doing, I think, very rigorous and uh, controlled studies of what happens when you show, when you subject someone to a narrative of another person's distress. And typically, in his experiments, there are two kinds of things. One group are told, focus on the technical qualities of this broadcast. You're asked to assess it for its technical qualities, but don't pay much attention to the content. The other group is told, listen to this story, imagine it empathetically, try to participate in it as much as you can. Now, he finds again and again that the second group not only report experiencing emotions such as compassion toward the person whose predicament is depicted, but then they go out and actually do something. I mean, he sets it up so that there's something rather easy that you can do to, let's say, drive a student who has a broken leg to class or something. So he makes it not too hard, but he does find that uh, people actually do it. And more recently, he's been extending it to works of literature. And he's, uh, you know, his classic experiment is just a simple narrative of a real life case. But now he is doing experiments involving how you see stigmatized groups in your own society when you hear a, a kind of literary narrative that humanizes them. And once again, he does find evidence that this transforms the, the attitude, at least for a time, and, and at least in the absence of other influences. So yeah, I think, I think we are getting evidence of this. Oh, okay, back there. <laughs> what about children with special needs? The, the, especially uh, your, uh, your idea about inclusion versus uh, special education or special education? Yeah, 
yeah, I've thought about this a lot, and actually in Frontiers of Justice, I, 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 do, I talk about that at some, some length. Um, I think, you know, the main approach that the uh, American Individuals with Disabilities Education Act has taken is an approach that focuses on mainstreaming, and the reason for that is a reason of respect and equality. I think the feeling is that so long as children are educated apart, uh, they will be perceived as dehumanized, as a mongoloid idiot or a child with this or that syndrome, rather than as Jamie or Art or whatever. So, and mainstreaming does work because I've got a nephew with uh, Asperger syndrome, and I notice that uh, you know when we we see a class in which children are effectively mainstreamed, then often the other children, when they're asked about their classmates, they simply describe them by name. They don't say, oh, then there's that one that has Down syndrome or something. But no, they, they talk about their friend uh, Jamie or, or whatever. However, it's not the case that in all circumstances that's the best for the educational development of that child. And in fact, uh, Down syndrome mainstreaming works quite well, but Asperger's syndrome, uh, it, it turns out that it doesn't work so well because children with Asperger's syndrome are very intellectually sophisticated, but they often have behavioral problems, and kids react badly to that. They, it's very hard to mainstream them because kids think, here's a very smart kid, there's nothing wrong with him, but he's acting very badly. And so it turns out that um, also the teacher finds the, uh, th this kind of kid difficult to deal with and very confrontational and so on. So uh, special ed um, often works better for those kids. So I think the, um, the approach is, is basically right, that mainstreaming is the method of choice, but there should always be the obligation of the state to pay for special ed if that turns out to be the thing that is best for the educational development of the child. Um, let's see. All right. Yes. Uh, the question might be of particular relevance in Israel or uh, a similar place would be how you would how you balance the humanistic education also with instilling a particular cultural identity and how you at the same time don't use that particular identity when you're emphasizing this universal outlook. Yeah, I, I think that's it's a very uh, important and delicate question because I think that you know, what one doesn't want uh, is a kind of colorless and rootless kind of cosmopolitanism where you belong everywhere because you belong nowhere. And, and so, uh, of course, a lot of the individual or more local identity can be transmitted through the family and through local social organizations. But I, you know, I think it's very reasonable that a disproportionate part of education should focus on understanding the history and problems of one's own nation. Now, of course, in a pluralistic society, you're probably not going to focus on understanding just the dominant majority group. That would imply that the others are less interesting. So what you, what you, th I think you should do is focus on understanding all the groups that are part of your society and then as to which one will be your identity. I think that, that should be left for the family and the, the outside school development. Uh, I, yeah, I think if education takes the project of nourishing the particular child's uh, strength of attachment to its own identity, that would be in great tension with the obligation to show equal respect for all the identities that are in the classroom. But certainly learning about it, they could do, and they can do a lot more, I think, than they currently do. In, in America, people are so afraid of giving a kind of superiority to one religion rather than another that they usually just don't do any teaching about religion or the history of religion. And I think they could do quite a lot more along those lines than they currently do, and then and, and, and we would understand each other a lot better. And then the children with those identities would also uh, be, be more secure in that. Thank you. We have two brief speakers left, Mr. David Fox on behalf of the Fox family, and Dr. Howard Dietcher, who will present the Seymour Fox Memorial Fellowships. All this will have you at dinner by 6.15. Mr. Fox. <clears throat> well, that was an absolutely terrific lecture. Um, but as many of you know, 
Uh, my father has spent the last 15, 20 years of his life dealing with Jewish education. So I'm following a lecture which on its face has very little to do with my father, and I was wondering what the connection is. So I actually called up Professor Nussbaum's office uh, to find out if she knew my father. And uh, after passing through a barrage of questions of whether I was from the Hindu right, um, I finally got through to her. And I said, well, Professor Nussbaum, I'm David Fox. Do you by any chance know my father? I was trying to figure out the connection. And she said to me, as she said here earlier, regretfully not. So then I wondered, well, maybe it's I'm from the legal profession. Professor Nussbaum is a professor of law. My father was involved in education. Maybe that was the connection. My father always wanted me to more, be more involved in the academic world. Um, I don't think that's the case. But as often happens, the world operates in strange ways. Um, Annette Hofstein, who has been probably my father's closest colleague for the last 10, 15 years, um, mentioned to me, before this conference was even a fully formed idea, I think it was about a year ago, she asked me, have you read anything by Professor Nussbaum? And I said, which was the truth then, I said, no, I haven't. And she said, well, you really have to, and you should start with a book called Poetic Justice. So I always follow Annette's suggestions, so that's what I did. I took the book Poetic Justice. It's also not as long as some other books, and I read it. And I want to point out some very interesting connection between Professor Nussbaum's work and my father. So first of all, in Poetic, Nussbaum, uh, Poetic Justice, um, Nussbaum states, <laughs> during the lifetimes of William James and John Dewey, it was taken for granted that academic philosophy was a part of public discourse. But during much of the present century, academic philosophy in the United States has had relatively few links with practical choice and public life. And then she goes on in a different section and talks about the following. Our project was to show how debates in philosophy, she's talking about a different area than my father dealt with, were relevant to the work of policymakers as they attempt to find ways of measuring and comparing. There she's talking about quality of life. Now for those of you, and there are many of you here who knew my father's work, work it's very difficult to come up with a more accurate description of the cornerstone of my father's thinking about theory and practice than what I just quoted from Nussbaum. Then you go on, you think about this book, Poetic Justice. Poetic Justice is about textual analysis. Happens to be about a Dickens book primarily, also about a poet and another writer. But she uses a style and a methodology that is eerily reminiscent of my father's engagement in textual interpretation, both as a teacher and as a thinker. Any one of you who have spent the endless hours as I have with my father reading Plato, Freud, and others knows exactly what I mean. Then finally, in Poetic Justice, Nussbaum says, in a different connection, <clears throat> that the reasoning involved is not only, she's talking about the impact of textual reasoning, that the reasoning involved is not only context specific, but also when well done, comparative, involving in conversation with other readers whose perceptions challenge or supplement one's own. This idea of co-duction, whereby the act of reading and assessing what one has read is valuable precisely because it's constructed in a manner that demands both immersion and critical conversation, comparison of what one has read both with one's own unfolding experiences and with the responses and arguments of other readers. If we think of reading in this way as combining one's own absorbed imagining with periods of more detached and interactive critical scrutiny, we can already begin to see why we might find it an active activity well suited to public reasoning in a democratic society. Again, for all of you who know my father's work with curricular deliberation and have dealt with him on Schwab, very difficult to think of a better way of putting what's a way of reasoning that has been so crucial to my father's thinking. So those are truly profound contact points and I truly wish that Professor Nussbaum could have met my father and perhaps a powerful collaboration could have ensued. Now there's another connection too that was mentioned, it has to do with Chicago. My father was born in Chicago, received his PhD at the University of Chicago, and we all grew up on the mythology of Chicago. Now the mythology of course started with the Chicago Bears and the Chicago White Sox, but for this group, maybe as importantly we grew up hearing about Dewey, Hutchins, Tyler, Schwab, and Bettelheim. Now mythology usually gets bashed with reality, by reality when you come to the present. But hearing Professor Nussbaum today and reading some of her works has transformed mythology for me into reality 
and enabled me to help, help me understand why my father spent so much time uh, 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 talking about the University of Chicago and its greatness. Now, textual interpretation was one of the centerpieces of my father's life. And he also wrote several books. In all fairness, they were good books. They were not great books in the Hutchins sense of great books. In this world, scalability, and by scalability, I mean the ability to amplify your impact and influence in the world without expending additional energy. And when one's life ends, there is no more energy to spend. Usually can only happen from great books or great creative endeavors. Obviously, my father has left behind his DNA and his biological children, Eitan, Danny, myself. But somehow my father, even in the absence of great books, has succeeded in creating what I call hundreds of brain children. And through conferences, books, discussions such as these, creating scalability for my father's life in a way that is unique. This event is just one example. One of my favorite philosophers said that brain children bring their father more honor than his biological children. And all of you today have brought great honor to my father. At a conference about my father, um, I think last month at the Jewish Theological Seminary, one of the speakers, I think it was Alan Hoffman, said how he continuously hears my father's sayings resonate in his voice, in his current activities. One of my, uh, and most of you know my father, one of his sayings, at least to me, would say, well, oh, he's just a talker. Now, I have to tell you, I've been talking to Professor Magidor for quite some time now about what we should do in honor of my father. And after being present here today and hearing about these fellowships, which are not my doing, I can hear my father's voice now saying to me, David, you're just a talker. <laughs> so on behalf of Sue, uh, my brothers Eitan and Danny, and Danny who couldn't be here today because he's putting the final touches on my father's second grandchild, and um, his entire family, all the people here who uh, um, uh, my father was dear to, I want to thank uh, Professor Magidor, the Melton Center, Mark Hirschman, and Howie Deicher for being doers, where I've just been a talker. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, and for the finale, as you hope for, from theory to practice, Mr. Howard Deicher, Dr. Deicher. Keeping, we, we began with Hebrew and we'll end with Hebrew gracefully. Professor Shlomo Fox, Zichrono Livracha, Behet Kunato, Kimenehel, Betsefer Lechinuch, Kanbu Universitai Vrit, Yazam et Yesod, and Mekaz Lechinuch Yudi, Bekimoto Bishnat, Elef Chamot Shishim Bishmona, Yachadim, Professor Moshe Davis, Zichrono Livracha, and Professor Nathan Rothenstrach, Zichrono Livracha. במהלך כל השנים, ממין הקמת המרכז ועד מותו, היה פרופסור פוקס מחויב במידה רבה לכל מרק... למרכז מלטון, והיווה והיג... חלק בלתי נפרד ממנו. הוא כיהן, הוא כיהן כחבר בוועדה הקדמית של המרכז, היה מעורב בכל פעילותיו, סייע לקידום המרכז להתפתחותו בכל דרך אפשרית. ותרם מידיעותיו, כשרה ביכולתיו, הבלתי נדלה, בעלת רעיונות, במתן עצות ובהגשמת התוכנית. לפני מספר שבועות, כמו שדייוויד עכשיו הזכיר, התקיים ב-JTS בניו יורק כנס מרתק בחינוך היהודי לזכרו של פרופסור פוקס, ושם השתתפו למעלה מ-200 סטודנטים, חוקרים ואנשי חינוך מכל קצוות ארצות הברית וקנדה. הופתעתי כמו רבים מבואי הכנס לגלות שמספר נכבד מאוד של חוקרים וסטודנטים בצפון אמריקה עוסקים בעיון רב במחקריו של פרופסור פוקס וממשיכים לדון בסוגיות החשובות שהעמיד בפנינו. הדבר עורר את התעניינותנו ובשובי ארצה החלטתי לברר האם האסכולה הפוקסיאנית ממשיכה להשפיע גם על חוקרים וסטודנטים כאן בארץ. 
ואכן התגלה כי השפעתה המחקרית של פוקס ניכרת באופן משמעותי במסגרות אקדמיות שונות בכל רחבי המדינה. כשדמותו של פרופסור פוקס ניצבת לנגד עינינו והידיעה כי תמיד הדגיש את החשיבות שבעידוד חוקרים צעירים בתחום החינוך היהודי החלטנו במרכז מטון שהדרך ההולמת ביותר להנציח את זכרו היא להקים קרן על שמו שתתמוך בקידומם של סטודנטים וחוקרים בתחומים המגוונים של החינוך היהודי. לפני כמה חודשים ייסדנו את הקרן ועד כה הענקנו מקרן זו מלגת פוסט דוקטורט לדוקטור דריה מעוז ולהבעה דוקטורנטים בשלבים מתקדמים של עבודתם. בנוסף על כך הענקנו מלגה משותף עם שוחרי האוניברסיטה העברית בקנדה לגברת אראלה ידגר על מנת לאפשר לה להקדיש את רוב זמנה להשלמת עבודת הדוקטורט. אלו ה... הענקנו את המלגות האלו לזכרו של פרופסור פוקס. On behalf of everyone who has joined us here this evening, I would like to express our sincere gratitude and appreciation to Professor Nussbaum, who accepted our invitation to join us for this meaningful event, and as a result of her powerful, insightful, and enlightening talk, has helped us honor the memory of our sorely missed teacher and mentor, Professor Seymour Fox. Toda Abba. What's left to say? One should be able to envisage one's teachers, and I think between Professor Nussbaum's words and everybody else's, we have a strong sense of mission for the education of endeavor, and I'm sure Professor Magidor is going to help us achieve it here at the Hebrew University. <laughs>